Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. God willing, tonight we shall complete our study on the book of Zechariah. We shall focus on the last two verses. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 20 and 21. God willing, next Tuesday evening, we shall commence with the study of the book of Malachi. Malachi was a book written soon after the completion of the walls of Jerusalem in the days of Nehemiah, and about 100 years after the completion of the temple. We're going to see some of the events, including the prophecy of the first coming of Christ in relation to John the Baptist, and the second coming of Christ in relation to Elijah. So God willing, next Tuesday evening, we shall study the book of Malachi. And so tonight, we shall commence by singing our hymn four, Hymn number four, holy, holy, holy. Hymn number four, in line with our theme for tonight, everything will be holy unto the Lord. Hymn number four, holy, holy, holy. Please stand as we sing our one and only hymn for tonight. shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, bless the Trinity. Holy, holy, Saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shalt be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful men thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall be thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Almighty God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, the thrice holy God, we thank Thee for gathering Thy people before Thy throne of grace and mercies once again this evening, on this Tuesday night, where we can approach Thee in the study of Thy holy word and to bring before Thee our many petitions and always in and through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, Thy only begotten Son, our great High Priest. Cleanse us and wash us, O God, of all our sins by the blood of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may approach Thee with clean hands and pure hearts. Still our hearts, remove any and every distraction, and quieten our hearts, O Lord, that we may learn to be still 
and to know that thou art God, indeed, thou art the Holy Heavenly Father. Help us always, O Lord, to seek holiness, for thou hast commanded us to be holy, for thou art holy. Bless our time together, O God, in the study of thy holy word, and we thank thee for seeing us through this past many weeks in the study of the book of Zechariah. And we pray, Father, that as we come to the concluding two verses, may thy Holy Spirit grant us illumination and understanding that we may behold wonderful truths out of thy holy word to encourage our hearts and to strengthen our faith as we soon see the day of the Lord that is fast approaching. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Please be seated. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 20 and 21. Please follow as I read to you from God's word. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and tick of them, and seeth, seeth therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Amen. May God bless us in the reading of his most holy and sacred word. We continue our study on what God has revealed to us pertaining to the millennium. Last Tuesday evening, if you recall, the Lord expects by law that everyone who lived during the millennium, including those who are born in the millennium with a sinful nature, to worship, to come to the new Jerusalem with the new millennial temple to worship him. Those who refuse to do so will experience drought, and if that is not enough, then they will experience plague, disease. And therefore, everyone would know that if anyone were to experience drought in his farm or disease in his body, it is because he refused to be found in the worship of the Lord once every year to observe out of all the many feasts, God highlighted the Feast of the Tabernacle which is one that reminds Israel of their deliverance from Egypt, the land of bondage, which is basically a reminder of the need for the Saviour to deliver us from the bondage of sin. So this is a compulsory attendance to expose themselves to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we know that in our time today, we desire our loved ones and friends and family members to come to church. And so we invite them, we pray for them. What is your intention? We know that coming to church, coming for gospel meeting, is not going to be the same as entering into the kingdom of heaven. But we understand the blessing and the benefit of it, especially if it is a sound biblical church, where the gospel according to scripture will be proclaimed. And so if they were to come, we pray that the Lord will prepare their hearts to come. And when the gospel is declared, which you know will be the case, that they will come to know Christ as Lord and as Savior. And so your desire to invite them, you cannot entice them, and you should never bribe them in any way or threaten them. But you need to invite them. And if they were to come, you thank God uh, that they say yes to your invitation, and so you'll pray fervently that there'll be no excuse that may come along the way or any obstacle that might arise that may prevent them from attending. And so you have this strong desire for their attendance. Well, in the millennium, it will be a compulsory attendance because the Lord who is omniscient will know all things. Those who are believers will have no problem. Believers in the glorified bodies, believers in the human mortal flesh who enter the millennium, at least 144,000 of them, 12,000 from each tribe, they will have no problem attending. But it's the children and the children's children that come after that. And so the Lord would want them at least once a year that they must come and be exposed to the gospel. But what exactly will be the main emphasis throughout this millennial 
kingdom, which is the whole earth, that the Lord wants us to know holiness. And we see this in these two verses. That's why the title, everything will be holy unto the Lord. So what exactly does it mean by everything? Verse 20b, in that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. So what does that mean? The bells upon the horses. What are horses for? Horses today are used for battle. So we know that in the millennium, there'll be no battle. So it cannot be a reference to battle. The horses are also used for trading and for business ventures, right? People will travel from point A to point B on horses, especially if you are a wealthy businessman. And so will, they be, will the Lord be referring to bells on horses where everywhere people go, there will be businesses that will only have holiness unto the Lord on their testimonies? That cannot be too. There will be no business conducted during the millennium. Now, how do we know that? Now, the, no warfare we can understand because the Lord is the only one who will reign. But what about business? Could that be a business? Let's look at Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65 is a description of what the millennial environment will be like, including the economy. And so when we look at this passage, you realize that the horses cannot be a reference to businessmen riding from place to place doing businesses. And that means we have to think of another way to understand the bells on horses that will send forth the message of holiness unto the Lord. So, Isaiah 65, verse 17 to verse 25. Now, as we read through, this is a description of the environment of the millennial in terms of the animals, in terms of the ages of people, and the economy. Right? You watch. Verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and new earth. So that's how we know that it will be completely recreated because after the trumpet and the vow judgments, the earth will be unlivable. And so the Lord had to recreate it. And the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. That's our present earth. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. All right, so this will be the new heavens and new earth of the millennium. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. So there will be Jerusalem mentioned also in the last verse of Zechariah. Now, take, bear this in mind. It will place a great rejoicing and a people of joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, that is Christ, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of Christ. So there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more death. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that shall not fill his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. In other words, if a person were to die a hundred, not saying that there will be death. So in other words, people will live a very long, 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 long life. How long? You watch. And the sinner being a hundred years old shall be a curse. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Now you watch verse 22. That's the economy. And they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now so you know from verses 21 and 22, that's the economy. It means there'll be no trading. Whatever you want to eat, you plant, you eat for yourself. And if your neighbor wanted to eat something, they plant and they eat for themselves. So if you want to live in a house, you build for your own. There is no more building projects for other people. There'll be no more trading or bartering or using currency or money like what we are doing today. So that means the horses in Zechariah cannot be businessmen riding from point A to point B to do business because there is no business, according to verses 21 and 22. Let's read on. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear, because the Lord will be on earth, ruling. And the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. So the only creature that will not be recreated to the former time before the flood. That means 
they are going to live and coexist in peace, what we now consider as the wild or dangerous animal like the lion and the very, very peaceful, gentle, meek lamb. They will coexist and nobody will kill each other. And the only creature that will remind the people in the time of the millennium on why they are born sinners would be the serpent that will continue to eat dust. So that the people will be told by the parents, why is it that all the animals are so at peace except this animal that continue to eat dust? And then they will take the opportunity to share the gospel with them. And then once a year, compulsory, everyone will attend the worship to observe the Feast of Tabernacle, to remind them and to listen to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by way of the animal sacrifices, which will have the same significance and meaning for us as the Lord's Supper, that is to look back to what Christ has done. So this very powerful King of Kings and Lord of Lords seated in Jerusalem was once upon a time the suffering Messiah, they need faith. To believe that because it is still salvation by Christ alone. Then shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. Now, so this is a very good description of the lifespan of the people in the millennium, the animal kingdom, the creation of the world. There'll be no more such things as tsunami and cyclone and earthquake and so on. There'll be only peace. The earth will once more be a very safe and comfortable dwelling place like before the fall, as it were. The only thing that did not change would be the old serpent. The serpent will continue to eat dust. But the economy, no more business, no more trading. Everybody will plant for their own consumption they build for their own uh, dwelling in the millennium. And that means, in that day shall there be upon the bells of horses. So what's the horses for then? So the only thing that we can think of concerning horses during the millennium, if it is not for warfare, if not for business, it's just simply for travel. Because the people will be farmers. They'll be traveling. You mean there'll be no motor cars, there'll be no high-rise building? Of course, high-rise building means that you need a lot of people to build. So there will be construction. There's no construction. Whatever you build, you live for yourself. You want an extra room, you build an extra room. Everything will be just for your own personal enjoyment and consumption with the Lord Jesus Christ reigning on earth. And before you ask anything, you have any issue, any problems, He will answer even before you ask. And so the horses will be basically for travel. In other words, everyone, when they travel from point A to point B, when they visit, what message will they carry with them? Holiness unto the Lord. So that means holiness unto the Lord will be the message. What is the message that you are sending to the people in your office? What message are you sending to your classmates, students? When the Lord tells us, go forth into the world, and be my witnesses. Be ye holy as I am holy. What message, pray tell? Isn't it holiness unto the Lord? Isn't that the message that we are sending forth? A bit here, a bit there, wherever God's born-again servants are sent forth, are located. Well, in the millennium, it will be pervasive. It will be everywhere. Everyone who travels. This will be the singular message that will cover literally the face of the earth. That's wonderful, isn't it? The Lord reigning on earth with a world that is so much at peace, all the animals are all at peace with one another. The environment of the earth will be so perfect where people live and grow and age like trees, where parents will continue to enjoy time with grandparents, great-grandparents and great-great-great-great-grandparents and their grandchildren and so on and so forth. When you study the book of Genesis, God willing, if we finish the book of Malachi, it's important to study the book of Genesis. So we study the last, and then maybe we study the first. And when we study the book of Genesis, it's interesting. I will give you all a table to do some simple mathematics to see Adam. He lived 930 years. Did you calculate to see how many generations of grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, great-great-great-great-grandchildren he enjoyed? Well, he was still alive. Do you know when he died at 930, how many 
of his descendants were born or was he able to enjoy? Did you take note? That's why numbers, ages are very important. Those who say age of people, names of people, name of places are not important, they are losing so much. And anyone who believes that kind of nonsense is doing great injustice to their understanding of God's Word. We must always have the highest view of God's Word in its perfection, infallibility, and in its inerrancy. And when you do the mathematics, you'll be amazed that God was so gracious to allow him to live 930 years, that he was able to see and experience the joy of so many of his descendants. And that list in Genesis is a description of all believers. That would be the Messianic line. And it will, of course, end with Noah. And then it will continue from Noah's son, Shem. And there'll be another list that will culminate in Abraham. Later on, his name will be changed to Abraham. So very, very interesting to study the book of Genesis. That long, long list of names in one particular chapter, what age they were and then they died, what age they were and then they died. There are a lot of interesting points for us to learn in that amazing chapter. So never, never boring. It's the book of life. And so it is horses for traveling where people will live hundreds of years, as the Bible tells us in Isaiah 64, where parents, grandparents, they all will enjoy multi-generations. And the only message, a reminder of the need for holiness, which means those who are not holy within. Everyone will be holy without. Everyone will be well-behaved, just like people come to church. Believers and unbelievers, when they come to church, it's very difficult to tell who is not a believer, isn't it? Because everyone behaves like everyone in the church. So it is very difficult for us to pinpoint who is not a believer in the church. Imagine this, expand this, multiply this global scale. So outwardly, everybody will be well behaved. But inwardly, the Lord will remind, are you holy within? Because that's the message, holiness unto the Lord. You ride on a horse that has bells that will remind people holiness unto the Lord. And then as you ride on such a horse, you've got to ask yourself, are you holy? Even as you send the message, holiness unto the Lord. You see how the Lord desire people during the millennium, those who were born with a sinful nature, to be saved? Day in, day out. This is day in, day out when they travel. And if it is not traveling, you notice the next verse, verse 20b, another area. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar, which is for worship. So the pots are usually that which they use to store all those utensils that they use when they boil the meat that they bring, the sacrifices. So now the pots themselves will also have the same message. That means that every item inside the temple when the people come for worship will be a reminder. There is no this is for the actual sacrifices, and these are just simply for the washing of the utensils that are used for the worship. Everything will be holiness unto the Lord. There is no segregation. There is no not holy, some holy, some less. Everything will be holy as unto the Lord. So when the people come to the temple for worship, every which way they turn their head, the message will hit them in the face. Holiness unto the Lord as you come, as you bring your offering. Holiness unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Isn't that the same message that we are going to hear day in, day out, eternally in heaven? That's why people who are holy within and holy without today will be very, very delighted and be very, very elated when they arrive in the new heaven and new earth of eternity. Not just this one. This one, you have the new heaven and new earth where the holy message is pervasive, but you still be rubbing shoulders with unbelievers, holy outside but not holy within. And they dare not demonstrate any form of outward rebellion because the Lord himself is seated on the throne. But in heaven, in the new heaven and new earth, where only glorified saints will enter, it's holy, holy, holy unto the Lord forever and ever and ever. And that's why you and I must always delight in holiness. And you know what holiness means. Get rid of sin. 
The moment you know there is sin in your heart, the moment sin begins to blossom as feelings, as desires, as lust, you have to stop it right there before it grows and before it comes out. That's why you've got to stop it. If you are angry with a person without a cause, that's why you have to stop it. Because if you don't stop it, remember last Sunday, Sunset Gospel Hour message, you're going to speak it out. Raka! Useless. And then if that is not bad enough, fool, moron, stupid, the danger of hellfire because it shows your evil, vindictive heart. Without a cause, you call him a fool. No reason other than some venomous hatred. A Christian cannot have that kind of feeling, cannot have that kind of emotion, especially when it is without any reason other than a sinful prejudice. Nip it in the bud. That's how God has taught us. Everyone who is born again will now have God's high standard and sensitivity to sin. That's what holiness is. The moment it begins, you ask for God, please forgive me, O Lord, for that lust in my heart. Forgive me. And once you ask God for forgiveness, the Lord, by His grace and mercies, will give you the strength to stop it right there and then. And every time that kind of sin begins, you repent straight away. A stronger inner desire for holiness as expressed by your daily getting rid of sin that only begins in the inner man before it comes out. And that is what God expects of all of us so that our external holy testimony for Christ remains intact. Because as long as it is not actually visibly committed, the testimony of holiness in your body remains intact. That's why God has taught us in the Sermon on the Mount that amazing, wonderful sermon, perfect sermon taught by the perfect preacher who lived a perfect life. So much to learn from that Sermon on the Mount. And no matter how many, many thousands of hours we spend studying that perfect sermon, we can only confess that we are scraping only the surface. The depth of that sermon can never, never be touched, the bottom of it. It's a wonderful sermon. Study it again and again and again. Every time you learn something new, that's how wonderful that sermon is. Holiness, when you ride on a horse and travel anywhere. Holiness, whenever you come to worship the Lord. Everywhere you turn your head in the temple, holiness unto the Lord. If that is not enough, verse 21a says, every city, in other words, holiness in society, your day-to-day -day life, every home, every farmland, every place where you live, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and seeth therein. In other words, when they worship as well, when they come for worship, that means there is no aspect of their life, there is no area in the whole world in the time of the millennium where the people are not reminded of holiness when they travel outside of their home to visit others, holiness. When they remain where they are, right? That's what the Bible says, Jerusalem, the capital city, and in Judah, the rest, holiness unto the Lord. The whole society is a vast global reminder to every human being, holiness unto the Lord. To those in the glorified bodies, it's an amazing, wonderful refrain. Holy, holy, holy. And then to those who are born again in this mortal flesh, also a wonderful refrain. Remember, they can still fall into sin as long as they are not in the glorified body yet. They will be like us today. The difference is they will witness in a perfect, restored world where Christ will reign and rule on earth. Unlike what we are doing right now, witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ in a world that is corrupt, evil, ruled by the God of this world who has blinded the minds of those who have rejected the gospel. But they will struggle like what we are struggling. 
but in a totally different environment where there will be no devil, where there will be no demons, where there will be no evil and wickedness outwardly. Only the same message, holiness unto the Lord. And then when they come for worship themselves, where they are, the desire for worship, to see therein, right, to boil therein. And in that day, there shall be no more the Canaanites, so there will be no more those who will build idols. It will be forbidden. Today, in Israel, I mean in the past, in the Old Testament, the temple and the temples to idols coexist side by side, even in the Promised Land. A lot of them were introduced by King Solomon to placate his hundreds of wives. And so coexists in the time of the millennium, there'll be only one place of worship. There'll be no Canaanite kind of idolatrous worship, zero. Only one place in the whole world, no other temple, no other religion, only one. And that is Christianity. One place of worship, one saviour, one way to heaven, one living and true God, no other. One king of kings, one lord of lords, everything. Same message, one, in holiness. Can you imagine such a wonderful world? Why do you think the Lord wants our church, every sound the biblical conservative church, to be holy? Some people think that when we exercise church discipline, when we preach against sin, it is because we are desiring a perfect church. We are not desiring a perfect church because that is not the message that God expects of us. God message, God's message to us has always been Old and New Testament that has not changed. Be ye holy as I am holy. And that's what holiness is. Get rid of sin. Get rid of sin as individuals. Get rid of sin when we see it in the lives of God's people in the church. That's why there is church discipline, because we want to help the person who is a sinner and also to help everyone at the same time so that all will fear. That's what pastoral epistles taught us when we exercise church discipline so that everyone will fear, that there will be consequences when we sin public sin. That's why if every one of us were to stop our sin at the inner man, lust level, you know how peaceful and how wonderful the church is? We will be very careful with our mouth. We will not call anyone raka. Obviously, we will not go to the next level that is to call someone moron, a fool. Without a just cause. If all of us were to stop the sin at the inner man, careful in what we write, careful in what we say. There will be so, so, so much more peace and tranquility. Isn't that true? Very often when we allow our mouth to speak words that hurt, and for whatever reason, we know that we should have stopped it at the inner man level. When the desire begins in our heart, the desire to speak out, before we actually said those words. If we nipped it in the bud, you know how many lives would have been so much sweeter and more peaceful if we were to just do that? Right? And that's what God tells us the millennium will be like. But you don't, and I don't have to wait for the millennium for that to become a reality. Because if you are truly born again in Christ, the reality of holiness has already begun in our heart. We know that. We know that that's why every born again believer desires to get rid of sin. The moment it begins, we ask the Lord for forgiveness. And we grieve. We hate it. We really despise it. And one of the things we know we will never, never, never miss is the struggle against temptation. Isn't that true? The moment the Lord gives us the glorified body, that tension, that struggle between the law of the Spirit and the law of the flesh. The law of the Spirit says, I want to be perfect. My desire is to be 100% holy and never ever to sin again. But then the law of the flesh, the weakness of the flesh that we struggle with, according to Romans 7, is that we will still stumble and fall. And our lust, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life will continue to be our 
evidence against us so that we cannot deny it. Because we know what these desires are still very much like. And that's why the Lord taught us repent right there and then so that holiness can return. Everyone who is truly born again will do that because holiness will be the environment that the Lord Jesus Christ will create during the millennium for every soul. And then when we arrive at the end of the millennium and God at the end of the great white throne judgment sent us, usher us into the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21, 22, which is our eternal home, it will also be holiness. Holy, holy, holy will always be the constant eternal refrain. And if we cannot and do not like holiness today, we have to check our salvation. If you do not want to get rid of sin, if you toy with sin, if you massage sin, and you let sin breed in your heart before it bursts out, then we have to really go back and check our salvation because a truly born-again believer will not want that. He will want to stop it and nip it in the bud. And if it ever bursts out because of some spur-of-the-moment anger, you utter certain words against your loved one, against the person that you're quarreling with, instead of a soft answer that turneth away wrath, you raise your voice and you say certain things that you know you should, have not, should not have said. You will regret it straight away and you will be grieved in your heart and you can't wait to ask the Lord to help you seek forgiveness and reconciliation as soon as possible. Then you will beg and pray to the Lord, Lord, please don't let it happen again. Because a person who is truly born again has been made holy. That's why the Lord described the Christians in the church in Corinth as saints in the introduction of that amazing epistle that dealt with a whole long list of transgression in the church in Corinth. One transgression after another, right? And yet the Apostle Paul deliberately reminded them in the introduction, you are all saints. So now I'm going to teach you by the inspiration of God how to correct and repent of all these transgressions that you have committed. From schism to lawsuits between brethren because of money, inheritance, and then uh, the abuse of the Lord's Supper, food offered to idols, abuse of spiritual gifts, a man sleeping with his father's wife, probably stepmother. Many, many transgressions, and yet he reminded them, you are holy saints. And then in 1 Corinthians, he did write, you were once upon a time homosexuals, adulterers, fornicators, the long list of sin, but you have been washed, you have been sanctified, you have been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let these sins no more characterize your life. Saints, it is real. The holiness that is within must now be visibly seen without. And everyone who is truly born again must experience this in his heart as one of the clearest evidence of a person who is truly born again in Christ. Everything will be holy unto the Lord in the millennium. But the question is, is it going to be only in the millennium that everything will be holy unto the Lord? To the child of God who is truly born again, everything will be holy unto the Lord. It should be today. In the millennium, it will be by God's ordained design in the new heaven and the new earth. But the people will be permitted by God to live eight, nine hundred years like trees with a new economy that doesn't require any trading, where the whole creation except for the serpent will be recreated and there will be no lion eating the lamb, everything will be safe. But with one united refrain, holiness unto the Lord, is the reminder to everyone. The one on horseback, in the temple for worship, in the society where they live, 
and when people desire to go for worship. And there'll be no more idols, no more idolater, at least outwardly, because there'll be no Canaanite. That's why the message must be applicable in the present. This revelation of a holy world with the Holy Saviour ruling and reigning on earth is a warning as well as an encouragement and a reminder to the present generation that we are to be holy today in order to understand the teaching of the holiness that will be in the future. May God help us and encourage our hearts that we who are truly born again may honestly say before the Lord, Yes, Lord, I desire to be holy as Thou art holy, for You have made me holy in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, our gracious, merciful, loving Heavenly Father, help us, O Lord, to be true to our own soul. And may Thy Holy Spirit bring much conviction to remind us of the reality of holiness in the heart, in the mind, in the entire being of one who is truly born again in Christ Jesus. But you have set us apart unto holiness where the moment we are, make known any sin that is in our heart, in our head, in our lives. A truly born again child of God who seeks holiness will repent sincerely and desire to get rid of sin as soon as possible by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may return unto holiness. Forgive us, O Lord, of all our sins, and may Thou help us from henceforth to be holy as Thou art holy all the days of our lives until we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. And may Thou be gracious and merciful to help us as we break off into our respective groups to seek Thy face and Thy favour for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Good night and God bless.